Jesus Christ is the light of the world, a light no darkness can overcome. The Lord be with you. Is everybody else's sound broken up? Yeah, problems with the sound we cannot hear. Yes, uh, the first announcement is um, um, on Amber's behalf. She has asked me to announce that after the unity service next week, we are going to be asking for um, members to tell some stories. So they're going to set up a video camera and we were asking if you have a favorite story, a Southminster story um, or what, you know, how did uh uh, what was a God moment for you in Southminster? Anything that you'd like to share about maybe another member that has passed on or, or whatever, we're going to be doing that and collecting these videos. Um, I'm not sure what we're going to do with the videos, but th be thinking about that because I know y'all have stories. So <clears throat> that'll be next week after the um, joint service. The other announcement is about our pumpkin patch. The pumpkins will be delivered on October 15th. We're going to be decorating all afternoon and then they'll come in about four o'clock and we'll be unloading and placing the pumpkins around and we're going to have a really good time. Please also be looking for a sign up sheet of some kind where you can sign up for time slots to sell pumpkins. We'll uh, have two people per time slot. <clears throat> and um, uh, also looking for some entertainers. If you know any singer songwriters or people that pick and grin or whatever that want to come out and play on October 23rd, that's our music day. We're going to set up right outside, right as we're selling pumpkins and they can sing pumpkin songs or country or rock or whatever they want to do. Uh, so let me know about that. Um, Forrest will be playing, uh, Nissa and myself, but we need a, a, a few more people. So that's that's that. Thank you.
Unto home that will never be the same to us. everywhere on every path inviting us to move with curiosity and compassion toward each other may we see that our home paths are the unfamiliar paths for someone with renewed compassion open our hearts for hospitality so that in welcoming we will grow together in peace expand our chances for love and deepen understanding like we are. Nudge and guide us, we pray. Amen. We sing number 17. Thank you. 
Join me in the prayer, a prayer of confession and assurance of pardon. The shore of the Sea of Galilee was the place where Jesus called the disciples away from their familiar lives and roles into an adventure, a journey that would change their lives and our world forever. After his cr crucifixion, the disciples returned there to the water in what they knew. But can you imagine? It would never be the same again. And it was there that the resurrected Jesus met them again. He offered them comfort through hospita hospitality, a meal on the shore. He meets us even now at these waters. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts and have not loved our neighbors as ourselves for what we have done and left undone. Forgive us when we return to the familiar in fear rather than promise. Forgive us when we turn inward rather than become the host you call us to be. Guide us when we seek to turn around. Lead us to travel in your ways. Amen. Know this, Jesus' welcome is always there. He stokes the flames of love and invites us to gather round, filling our emptiness, calming our fear, making home for all. He is our constant companion, inviting us to reach out in care to one another, traveling together toward the kingdom of love. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Prayer for illumination. Holy God, as your word is read and preached, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The first scripture reading this morning is Psalm 36, 5 through 9. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to Nazi towering ways be 
before you roll. At the end of doubt and peril is eternity. Though fear and conflict seize your soul. Just think of stepping on shore and finding it heaven, of touching a hand and finding it God, of breathing new air and finding it celestial, of waking up in glory and finding Surrounded by the blackness of the darkest night, oh, how lonely death can seem. At the end of this long tunnel is a shining light, for death is swallowed up in victory. Just think of stepping on shore and finding it heaven, of touching a hand and finding it God, of breathing new air and finding it celestial, of waking up in glory. taking off other things too. <laughs> Our gospel reading this morning is from John's gospel. We're reading from the 15th chapter. And these are very familiar words. Jesus is talking to his disciples, knowing that he is going to depart from them soon, knowing that they are fearful, knowing that they are confused. And he offers these words of comfort and reassurance. You've been journeying together as you um, worship together these last few weeks. And today we're talking about what it means to come back home after we've left, after we've journeyed for a time. And this was a time when the disciples were going to find a new sense of home. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples." 
As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for, for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I'm giving you these commands so that you may love one another. This is the word of the Lord for the people of, of God. Thanks be to God. It is always good to be with you. And, and Bethany and I were talking um, between services this morning about um, when things happen in church that are funny to us, but it might not seem appropriate to laugh. As we were singing the first hymn about the animals all singing, I was thinking about our dog, Lucy, who loves to sing with us. If she hears us singing at home, she howls. Um, and I think it's not because she's singing praise to God. I think actually we are hurting her ears <laughs> and that's what makes her sing. But it is something to behold, I'm telling you. Um, Debbie sent me a funny message this week. I had emailed her when I read the, the bulletin. She sent a copy to me, and I realized that the, the title for the sermon was printed with just a, a couple of errors, and um, the, the true title for the sermon is Coming Home to Our True Selves. And she said to please, she had already printed the bulletins when we communicated, and she said to please tell you that she had had too many cups of coffee when she wrote those words, but it's close enough where it would have worked just fine as she had it. Coming Home to Our True Selves. When we emerge at birth from the safety of the womb, we still perceive ourselves as one with the mother in whose warm body we grew. Immediately after birth, secure in the arms of those who swaddle us and hold us close to a beating heart, which has been our persistent lullaby in utero, we gradually begin to exert individual power as a human being, as someone separate from the body and life of the one who gave us life. In fact, learning our separateness from her and others is our first developmental task as human beings. Paradoxically, those of us who succeed in that task of separation with the least amount of trauma are those who have bonded most completely with our earliest caregivers. We best learn the truth of our separateness from a place of safety, a place where we are held securely by those who show us in their goofy smiles and soft voices and abundant kisses that we are loved who let us know that we have done something noteworthy when they mirror or echo for us the things we do and the sounds we make, who show us that there is safety in boundaries and who communicate with us through gentleness that we are just right as we are. Over time, we learn that other human beings have feelings, too, that if we kick or hit or bite, the victim of our assault will suffer. As toddlers, we are still very self-centered. But when we are loved and when we see thoughtfulness and kindness enacted, we gradually learn how to share and how to listen and how to find joy in playing with others and how to solve problems with friends or siblings and how to say what we need and give to others what they need. 
Home is the arena where this most important foundation is laid for a healthy sense of self and relationships. And if all has gone well on that earliest training ground, we are ready to enter new arenas to develop further the skills of relationship building and cooperation and collective problem solving and demonstration of respect for others. Home and family are also the earliest training grounds for how we manage conflict and how we speak the truth of what we see and believe, speaking that truth in love. Jesus called his first followers away from kin into a new kind of family, broader and wider, larger and deeper. He called them away from everything that was familiar and certain to a new way of being in the world and a different orientation. And through his teaching, his preaching and healing, and mostly through the many ways he daily showed his deep love for them, he helped them find security in the knowledge of who they were at the core of their being. Their essence, their reason for being on this earth was that they were God's beloved, God's beloved children. In the verses we read together this morning from John's gospel, Jesus and his disciples have gathered together for supper. He has very little time left with these men. So after the meal, after Jesus has washed their feet and Judas has gone out of the room and into the darkness of night, Jesus speaks to them as though he is trying to say everything one more time and say it carefully and say it so they won't forget it when he isn't around to say it anymore. He speaks words of comfort. He tells them not to be troubled. He tells them that he will not leave them alone, that the Holy Spirit will come to them to be their advocate and their guide. And then he says, I am the true vine. And it was only after the earlier service today in this sanctuary that I noticed that your banner here has those very words and a depiction of the true vine. Those words would have had special significance for Jesus' disciples. Throughout the Hebrew scripture, Israel is, refer is referred to as a vineyard or a vine. The prophet Jeremiah speaks God's word to the Hebrew people saying, I planted you as a vine, fruit bearing, true. So when the disciples hear Jesus describing himself as the true vine, they would hear a revelation of one sent by God. In fact, earlier they had heard him preach that whoever believes in him believes in God. With hearts pounding, these disciples listen to this one they have come to love. They know that he is going away. In their confusion about where he is going and what exactly that may mean for them, his words reach back in time to their shared heritage and stretch into a future without him physically present, carrying them into the unknown but now on the secure promise that they are part of something that transcends the present moment and that is greater than all their fears. They are connected to God by this one who has called them children and friends, who has shared a simple supper with them and has washed their feet. In order for us human beings to keep on keeping on, we have to have something to hope for something to hold on to, something that is steady and sure. That may be especially true for us now, since change occurs today almost at the speed of light. Just about the time we have grabbed hold of a concept or an idea or mastered a new computer program, we learn that something else has come along to replace it. Just about the time we feel as if we have things lined up in our lives, things under control, a worldwide pandemic shows us how wrong we were. In our contemporary Western culture, 
a typical response to the uneasiness of the times is to get busy. We stress competition and productivity. With our roots planted in the ground of our individuality and our pioneer spirits watered with the attitude of self-sufficiency, we push ahead and are tempted to walk over those who have a hard time keeping up. Sadly, the suggestion that anybody who tries hard enough can have the good life has left many people feeling dejected and discouraged. People who have tried very hard, but who have been left out on the margins of all kinds of opportunities. So looking out for number one, some of us who have been privileged are inclined to blaze a trail and leave anybody behind in the dust who got a slow start because of where they were born or because of their race or ethnicity, their sexual orientation or their gender. If we are to keep up with the times, we must keep abreast of the changes, we say, so we roll up our sleeves and go to work. We're working longer than ever before. We are building our portfolios and securing our assets. We, never may, we may never be home long enough to enjoy our luxury or to be with our friends or family, but by golly, we're going to make sure that we are on top of things. Two poisonous beliefs are operating here even sometimes with the best of intentions. First is the belief that we are in control of our own destiny. And second, the notion that we can achieve what we are looking for in life solely by our own efforts, by pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps single-handedly. The results are deadly because they disconnect us from the real source of life and from each other. We think that if we just work long enough hours or are smart enough or attractive enough or young enough or busy enough, if we do enough of the right kinds of things or acquire enough money or power or possessions, nothing can ever hurt us or get in the way of our security. But what happens instead in this pursuit of self-sufficiency are feelings of boredom, resentment, and depression all sentiments of the disconnected. Listen, listen. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. As the true vine, Jesus is the source of life, the whole vine. Roots, stem, branches, leaves, life itself. And God is the vine grower. The one who plants and tends and nurtures and prunes. It is not through our willpower or our hard work that the destiny of the world is determined or that we find any ultimate sense of peace and security. It is not what we do or what we fail to do, not what we purchase, not what we acquire or accumulate. It is instead through this one who came to us as Emmanuel. God with us, to show us that God is love, and that through God's loving care, we are sustained and nurtured for a life of joy and peace and purpose. Cut off from that source, disconnected, depending only on our own resources, we become depleted and dry, dead on the inside. Abide in me, Jesus says. I am the vine. You are the branches. You are as closely united to me in the essentials and entirety of life as those branches are in the vine. Abide in me, Jesus says. In other words, find your true home in me. Can you see the wonder of that? We make it possible for what God intends in the world to come about, not by our dogged individual efforts, but instead by our fusion with Christ as the source of all that is good and in our connection and cooperation with one another. In resting in Christ and holding on to one another, we are empowered to do the hard work of the kingdom. To the earliest disciples, Jesus said, 
you know that I have to go away from you and you are troubled. But I am here now offering the assurance that my spirit will come to you as comforter and guide. I have united you so closely with myself that you are now a part of me and I am a part of you. Ours is a perfect fruit-bearing union. Those earliest disciples were first followers of Jesus and then became apostles. The word apostle comes from the Greek noun meaning one sent out. They left home, but in a deep sense, they brought home their abiding peace, their abiding place with them wherever they went. In our union with Christ, we as Christ's church bear fruit. That fruit is the good news of God's love that we share with a world hungry for hope. We are called as branches of the true vine to climb and trail and flow into lifeless places, not by our own efforts, but by our union with our life-giving source. The earliest Christians were sometimes referred to as people of the way. They were people on the way, sent out. And they were people of the way, the way that brings life and hope. Remember that it was in John's gospel that Jesus told his followers that he is the way and the truth and the life. We, too, are people of the way. And as the church of Jesus Christ, we are called to show the way by being agents of hope and healing. It's a funny thing how that works. God's life-giving power flows into us as we become the body of Christ for the world. Power from on high courses through the branches of our veins. Power we experience only when we're ready to release it, to help, and to heal. Home and family hold different meaning for us at different stages and chapters of life. And that's true for our church home and family as well. Church may have been, for some of us, the idyllic place of stories and paintings, the little brown church in the Dell, a place where we truly feel at home. That was certainly for me true for me growing up. We had a lot of sadness at my home with my family, in my family. But at church, I really felt at home and I felt a sense of peace. But sometimes some of us along the way have felt left out of things on the periphery and lonely. Some of us may be recovering from experiences in church in which we were deeply wounded or disappointed some of us have carried many responsibilities in our church life and have felt harried and worried about all the obligations of that work or have been preoccupied with a million details that need attending, counting money and paying the bills, planning for building maintenance, meeting for the upteenth time with the committee, encountering people we find difficult. Just as in home with our families, in our church home, we may make long to-do lists and work ourselves ragged and struggle with doubts, face desperate loneliness, long for privacy, encounter our demons, and ask questions about significant relationships. Households of faith mirror our understanding of who we are in relationship to God and to one another. They are anchoring places where over time, we craft the practices by which we prosper or fail to prosper. We gather together to remind each other of Jesus' words, Jesus' promise. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus says, I am the shepherd of the sheep. I am the gate through which the sheep enter. I am the bread of life. I am the true vine. In our baptism, we are engrafted into Christ and welcomed into the household of faith. In our communion, we eat the bread of life and drink the fruit of the vine. God loves us, not because we have deserved that love and not in spite of any undeserving, 
not because we try and not because we recognize the futility of our trying, but simply because God has chosen to love us. We are God's children because God is our creator, our parent. And all efforts, fruitful and fruitless, to do good, to speak truth, to understand, are the efforts of children who, for all their precocity, are children still, in that before we loved God, God loved us. In a beautiful reflection, Episcopal priest Martha Stern reflects on the ways Jesus created a home, a resting place for his disciples, and I close with her reflection, her words. May her words bring comfort and peace to us all as we strive with God's help to come home to our true selves. Jesus said, shh, peace, don't be scared. Don't worry, it's going to be all right. Trust God, trust me. We have a place just for you. I wouldn't lie to you. I'm showing you the way to get there, and I'm going to take you home. Soft voice, murmuring words. They must have loved the sound of the voice as much as the words. He'd made a home for them these years, even on the road. He had washed their feet and fed them supper, but then he said disturbing things about leaving them, about going away. They were anxious, worried. He had been their homemaker. He'd hugged them and kidded them and made them laugh. He made their friends welcome and figured out how to feed all the extra company that showed up, a couple of times making a tiny mess of fish and a few measly loaves of bread go so far that it was like a miracle. When they went out, he was the one who reminded them to put on their cloaks and take their staffs and their sandals. He took them seriously and said they would do wonderful things. And he loved each one fiercely, and each one knew it. He was a homemaker. He must have learned some of his homemaking from his mother, Mary, the one whose rhythms of blood and breath gave him his first songs. Her love had even been brave enough to let go of him, to start biting her lip and stop saying, be careful, as he grew up. Surely it was her brave love and trust in God that let her boy loose to become who he was meant to be, to find his own way with strange friends and wild talk and frightening possibilities. And of course, ultimately, her son faced a terrible death. But remember the words he shared with his disciples before he left them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I will not leave you comfortless. My spirit will be with you always. Perhaps the heart of Christian living is to begin wherever with whomever to be homemakers, to hold our hearts open and roomy, to make room for the ones who do not seem at home in the world, the isolated, the alienated, to live as if we belong to God, and to one another, because, because, of course, we do. Amen. Sure. Celebrate a moment of generosity. First, let me relay uh, thanks to each of you for your continuing generosity for the mission of this church. This morning, we've got a brief uh, video clip, I think, if it's still.
morning. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Hello. Um, this year, I think on October 3rd, we are doing the Peace and what is it? Peace and Global Witness. Peace and Global Witness offering in 25% of that is going to the Mary Parish Center. Um, I've worked with the Mary Parish Center for four years now, I think. So I was going to give you guys a little bit of an overview of what they do and all that kind of stuff. They are based in Nashville and they are a nonprofit that helps women. Morning. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Hello. Um, this year, I think on October 3rd, we are doing the peace and what is it? Peace and Global Witness. Peace and Global Witness offering in 25% of that is going to the Mary Parish Center. Um, I've worked with the Mary Parish Center for four years now, I think. So I was going to give you guys a little bit of an overview of what they do and all that kind of stuff. They are based in Nashville and they are a nonprofit that helps women and their families who are fleeing um, domestic violence or interpersonal violence situations. They provide a lot of different kinds of services, but one of the big ones is free housing for up to a year, along with um, like counseling. And a lot of times when women flee these situations, they have absolutely nothing. So they provide them with, you know, all the kitchen stuff that they need and a safe place to live and a, like just a place to be able to like reset their lives. So it's really amazing. They are located in Nashville in a secure location, um, but they help through that program and some other ones, thousands of people in Nashville every year. So they're super, super cool. You can go to maryparish.org and learn more about them. I think I'm going to have something in the newsletter that explains a little bit more, but I didn't know that Tennessee is in the top five, five most dangerous states for women and that domestic violence is the leading cause of homelessness in our state. So, which is crazy. Um, so it's just a really huge, huge need there. They're doing absolutely incredible stuff. The stories are just heartbreaking and beautiful. So check them out. They're awesome. I'm really happy that there are people <laughs> this year. So if you have any other questions about them, just let me know. Stand. As we turn to God in prayer this morning, I wanted to ask first if there are prayer concerns you bring at this time. Yeah. Someone was going to be recording these for us, and I think it is Pat. I 
think she's going to record for it. This is John, and uh, two of my friends, and our friends really, died this last week. Uh, Fred Lewis in Eastern Kentucky, and Mary McClendon, who uh, lives with us out in the uh, heritage. Okay. She is remarkable because she's the apparently the longest surviving uh, Parkinson's disease patient we know of. John, did you say Fred and Mary? Is that correct? That's correct, and they they both um, were. It, it was it was good, uh, a good passing. They okay. they both passed at home with her family. Peaceful passing, and we give God thanks for that. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayers. Forrest. Uh, prayers for the family of Joe Swinson. Uh, Joe Swinson was a uh, fellow piano technician in the area, um, and he recently passed away from medical complications. So just prayers for his family during this time. So prayers for um, Joe Swinson, a friend of Forrest's who passed away this past week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Are there others? Uh, this is Pat. Oh. Prayers for Priscilla Adcock, who <clears throat> does have COVID, is recovering. So just prayers for continued recovery. Um, and I, I continued recovery for Anita. I didn't know if anybody had current information on Anita Kimbrough. It looks as if someone does. <laughs> Pat, I talked to Anita yesterday and she seems to be doing fairly well. She's still at the uh, rehab center and um, going to dialysis three times a week but she seems to be doing a teeny, teeny bit better. Okay, thank you. So continued, continued prayers for continued Anita. prayers for Anita. Kimbrough, yeah. And for Priscilla, God, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayers. Are there others? Oh Lord, be our abiding place. God of love, we bow before you in this shelter house of prayer once more to give thanks. Together we gather celebrating your presence and creation around us in the flowing air, in the fertile earth, and in the life-giving waters. Together we, get, we gather aware of the countless prayers of joy and of suffering that have been offered in this place. But oh Christ, you have inspired the journeying of your people. Grace us with your continued presence and inspire us to be a people of hospitality. O oh Lord, be our abiding place. O oh, Jesus, you sat at table with the betrayed and rejected of Palestine. We pray for those today who do not feel welcomed in their daily lives. You identified with the poor and with those who had no place to lay their heads. We pray for the thousands of homeless men and women, old and young, in our cities. 
You belonged to a refugee family. We pray for the millions of displaced people in our world. We pray for those who are victims of violence. You cared for your companions and for the little ones who surrounded you. We pray for the people for whom you have called us to love and serve. You prayed that we might be one as you and the Father are one. We pray that during this week, we may feel at home with one another and with you in our midst. O oh Lord, be our abiding place. There is a prayer. Teach us now, O Christ, to pray as brothers and sisters. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand. benediction this morning, I would like to offer a blessing that is in the Iona Abbey worship book. As you may know, pilgrims come from all over the world to the Isle of Iona, and this is a blessing that's offered to those who have been there as pilgrims who are returning home. The Maker's blessing be yours on your road, on your journey guiding you, cherishing, cherishing you. The sun's blessing be yours, wine and water, bread and stories, feeding you, challenging you. The spirit's blessing be yours, wind and fire, joy and wisdom, comforting you, disturbing you. God's blessing be ours, the blessing of pilgrims all the nights and days of our journey home. God bless you all in the name of the Trinity of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.